A couple weeks ago, I was having lunch with my friend Eliana, and I was telling her about doing this talk and how I was a little bit nervous. And my friend Eliana is a stylist, so although she was very like, oh, you're going to be great, it's going to be fine, she also said, well, what are you going to wear? <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm a little bit more worried about what I'm going to say. You know, but it's true, in the back of my mind, I was kind of thinking about what I was going to wear. And she reassured me, oh, you'll be fine, you'll look great. But then suddenly she shot me this look, and she said, just make, you wear, make sure you wear some good shoes. It's amazing how many people who do TED Talks don't think about their shoes. <laughs> well, I felt a little bit like this after my lunch with Eliana. But a few days later, I was thinking about it, and I was thinking a little bit more deeply about what she had said. And I suddenly realized that she'd given me the key to my talk. You see, I want to talk to you about shoes. More specifically, the importance of stepping into other people's shoes, especially when talking about some of the world's deepest traumas. As a documentarian and humanitarian, I have spent over 20 years doing just that. And the longer I live, and the more stories and people I encounter, the more I realize the value and importance of empathy which is the act of stepping into someone else's shoes. I was a student of empathy long before I knew what the word meant. I grew up in New York City, and I remember being drawn to stories like that of our neighbor, Mrs. Bondi, who'd survived the Holocaust by pretending that she was Christian. I also remember seeing the tattooed number on my father's friend, Mr. Reese's arm, and asking my father what that number meant. My favorite book as a child was The Diary of Anne Frank. I used to read it under the covers over and over again at night. I was so connected to the story that when my family moved to London when I was 10, and my mother asked me where I'd like to go for spring break, I immediately said Amsterdam. And when my mother said, great, clogs, canals, tulips, I said, yes, and Anne Frank's house. We have to go to Anne Frank's house. Now, I had read The Diary of Anne Frank dozens of times. I practically knew it by heart. But standing there in the place where she had lived and hidden and was ultimately captured gave me a far deeper appreciation for what she and her family had endured. I remember standing in the secret annex, listening to the guide tell us about what she had had to go through with her family. I remember being particularly affected by the fact that they couldn't go outside and that they had to put a curtain up during the day so that they wouldn't be caught. And when the guide told us about how quiet they had to be, that any little noise could betray them, I remember feeling floorboards beneath my feet creak. And I remember thinking to myself in that moment that if it had been me, I wouldn't have lasted a minute. My trip that I took with my mother to Amsterdam when I was 10 had a direct impact on my life and my work. It led me to study the Holocaust at Georgetown University with a renowned scholar named Michael Berenbaum. It also activated my creative desire to connect people through story. And nowhere is that more obvious and that connection more obvious than with one of my earlier works, which is called Memories of Childhood. The Memories of Childhood was an interactive installation that had images of people who had perished in the Holocaust woven into a stone wall. If you touched on the image of a face, that face would fade out, and the video testimony of a child survivor would start to play. The, the, the memory would start playing as long as you kept touching, but if you let go of the wall, the memory stopped playing. The idea was that you were pulling out the memory and that you were keeping it alive through your touch. One of my favorite teachers when I was growing up was my grade school teacher, Mr. Neuberger. He was my math teacher, and he had this wonderful way of making numbers and math engaging and fun. And I remember one day, on a Friday, he gave us an assignment. He said, your assignment today is to count to a million over the weekend. He's like, you can work in groups, you can work individually, but you have to get it done by Monday. Now, 
In case you're wondering, you can't count to a million in just a weekend. It's like a little bit more like 11 or 12 days. But we didn't know that, so off we went. And a funny thing happened on Monday's math class. Mr. Neuberger said to us, OK, everyone, how many people completed the assignment? Amazingly, a few hands shot up. He said, OK, how many people completed the assignment but failed? More of us raised our hands. And then he asked the people who hadn't raised their hands why they hadn't completed, they hadn't even tried. And they said, well, they knew it was impossible. So it was just a waste of time. I had a really great pleasure of seeing Mr. Neuberger last year at the 100th anniversary celebration of our school in New York City called the Town School. And I asked him, I said, why did you give us that assignment? And he said, it was his way of helping us begin to understand the large numbers. I imagine that some of you, when you see this large number, might think about Rwanda. 800,000 is the number of people estimated to have been killed in the Rwandan genocide that started on April 6, 1994, exactly 20 years ago tomorrow. I have the unusual background, or the somewhat unusual background, of having lived in Rwanda in 1989 for seven months as part of a work-study program through Georgetown University. I was there before the trouble started, and I left in 1990, um, a few months before the Civil War broke out. But when the president's plane was shot down and the killing began in 1994, I was finishing my master's in New York at the Interactive Telecommunications Program at NYU. All of my friends and family called me to find out what was going on, but the only people that I knew who would have any information were in Rwanda, and all of the phone lines and emails had been cut. So I found myself, like most people, glued to the television set, watching the horrifying footage of just bloated, dead corpses floating in the river. And the more I watched, the more disconnected I felt. And I was filled with a sense of apathy, the kind of feeling you get from something you can't be doing anything about. I finished graduate school a month later, and I flew to Paris to start what was supposed to be my dream job. But I was deeply unhappy. You see, I couldn't stop thinking about the people that I knew in Rwanda and wondering if they had survived. These were not just nameless, faceless numbers. These were human beings who deserved our attention and support. And the more I thought about them, the more I thought about being there and how to get there. It was kind of an amazing thing. You see, apathy shuts us down, but empathy cracks us open. And I went from thinking I couldn't do anything to wondering how I could get there. I ended up returning to Rwanda in the summer of 1994. It was an amazing experience driving from the capital down to the southwest, southwest camps where I worked. When I had worked in Rwanda in 1989, Rwanda was the most densely populated country in sub-Saharan Africa. But as we drove down these war-torn war roads, I didn't see one person. And when I said to our driver, where are all the people? He just said to me, ils ne sont pas là. They are not there. Most of the work our, of our team's work was to help and make sure that people in the camps had adequate food, water, and shelter. We were also in charge of tracking, or attempting to track, the numbers of people in the camps and the numbers of people returning home. But those early months after the genocide were extremely unstable, and most of our Rwandan staff were extremely traumatized. It was on, in those months that I found often that when I was driving with a local staff member by myself, they would tell me the story of what happened to them during the genocide. I never asked them to tell me these stories. They just did. And when we got out of the car, 
it was never spoken of again. The difficult thing about empathy is that it's a very hard thing to quantify. I can show you reports about the numbers of people that we've fed and sheltered and clothed. I can also show you details about the number of people that we helped to repopulate or replant their, their communities when they returned home. But if you ask me to tell you how many people I helped by operating from a place of empathy, I couldn't give you an answer. But <laughs> I can give you tangible evidence in the value of, of empathy. I can. And I can tell you that in the following story. One of my mentors was a man named Walter Scheuer. Wally, as we like to call him, was an Academy Award winning filmmaker and an amazing and extraordinary philanthropist who was, had a passion for young children and for classical music. The year I got back from Rwanda, Wally gave me a grant and office space to develop Memories of Childhood, the installation on child survivors of the Holocaust with my college friend. And one day I was in my office and my phone rang and an unknown woman's voice came on on the other end when I picked up. And she told me that her name was Laura Sims and that she was a storyteller and that she had been working with children at the UN and had been very moved by this one child, this young boy who had been a child soldier in Sierra Leone. She had been working tirelessly ever since to try and get him out, but she couldn't find anyone to guarantee his financial education. She couldn't get anyone to pay for it. And without that, she couldn't bring him here. As I listened to her telling me the story of this young man, I remembered all the soldiers that I had seen and the young soldiers I had seen in Rwanda. They were the ones who had these glazed eyes that were dark from all of the atrocities that they had witnessed. And I couldn't help but put myself and in that place for that moment and see that Ishmael was really in the same shoes. And I realized that he himself had very, very little probability of having any kind of future if he didn't get out of Sierra Leone. Now, the only person that I could think of who had both the means and the heart to help this young man was Wally. But I was having a hard time thinking about how to tell the story in a way that would really reach him. And then Laura said an amazing thing. She said that this young man was a rapper. He rapped. And that he believed that his music saved his life because the soldiers really liked his songs. So I went up that afternoon to Wally's office and I told him the story of the boy soldier whose life had been saved by music. And the rest of the story is history. As you may have guessed by now, this young man is Ishmael Bea. And Ishmael Bea is the author of a, a book called A Long Way Gone, which is a best-selling memoir about his life and times as a child soldier. And that book has gone on to reach and touch millions of people. And it's a beautiful story. When I got back from Rwanda the second time, a lot of people asked me to write about my time there to make some kind of project, a film, that would help them connect <laughs> to know more about what these people went through and what the place was like. And I spent months, I did, I spent months and months trying to come up with something, but nothing felt right to me. It just didn't. And to be honest, I felt like I let a lot of people down. So in 2001, Laura Sims, the storyteller that I had helped to get Ishmael out of Sierra Leone with, Laura Sims called me and she said, Heather, I'd like you to I'd like you to direct an oral history. And the oral history will be a series of interviews between me and one of my mentors, Vi Hilbert. So Vi was an amazing person. Vi was a member of the Skagit community. She was a Skagit elder of the northwest coast of Washington state. She had the ability to call animals to her house. And she talked to her departed relatives like we would talk to anybody over the phone. She was also a master storyteller, and she had an ability to let people know what stories were about. And one night, Laura, Vi, and I sat up late one night, and Laura said, 
that I had been to Rwanda. And Vi said, please tell me your stories. And for the first time since I had been back from Rwanda, I shared the stories that I had been afraid to share. And Laura and Vi sat there, their hearts open, and received them with grace and skill. And I stayed up with Vi a little bit later that night, and I asked her, and I said, Vi, what should I do with these stories? I don't know what to do. And she said to me, nothing. You're not supposed to do anything more with these stories. You did what you were supposed to do. You received them. And it was in this moment that I learned the most important thing and lesson about empathy that I could share with you right now is that empathy is not about being a hero. Empathy, at the heart of empathy, is really the subtle exchange between people of equal importance and value. And out of that exchange, amazing things can occur, and sometimes miraculous. It's not about saving someone's life, but you might save someone's life. But that's not because you're extraordinary. That's because empathy is the vehicle of truth, and truth moves us quite literally to do things that we could not imagine ourselves capable of. So i like to end this right now with a quick thing, which is to say the following. My friend James, who's been helping me on this talk, said to me at the end, after I did a run-through, he said, what's their takeaway? What's their parting gift? And I said, James, I'm exhausted, and I'm tired, and I still haven't figured out what I'm going to wear. I said, I can't think about a parting gift. But I left, and of course, I was still thinking about the parting gift. <laughs> and I raced around New York, doing everything I had to do to get ready for this talk, and I was running down the stairs to the subway. And I looked up, and there I saw it, your parting gift, in the form of an advertisement. And it was an advertisement for Johnny Walker Black. And it said, your next step might change your life. Keep walking. And that's what I would leave you with. It's like, your next step may, take, may change your life. Keep walking. And I would flip that to a slightly higher position on the evolutionary scale and say to you, keep walking. The next step you might take might change someone else's life. Thank you very much.